Futures Research Program to investigate the impact of improved forages on which um, farm production and profitability. So um, yes, you guys, Laura's going to present on satellite farming, the, the size of a prize. So um, yeah, look forward to hearing it. Good afternoon everyone, it's great to be here on behalf of Lincoln University. Uh, my two PhD supervisors, Professor Derek Moot and Dr Anna Maria Mills would love to have been here. Unfortunately COVID has stripped through all of the Lincoln Plant Science Division, so they are isolating at home. <laughs> but uh, today here on behalf of the team at Lincoln, I'm really excited to uh, talk through uh, what I've been doing over the past 18 months through the start of my PhD and uh, what the future might look like in regards to some options for farmers around how we navigate the landscape in regards to production but also greenhouse gases, nutrient loss and the viability of farm systems moving forward. Mm. So as an overview, the Hill Country Futures Project is an $8.1 million program focused on future-proofing the profitability of New Zealand's sheep and beef sector. And my component and contribution to New Zealand's Hill Country Futures Program is all around the biodiversity and forage landscapes. So that's trying to produce for New Zealand farmers a forage ag yields database where any one of you guys can go to a free repository, find an array of information around a selection of New Zealand forages, red clover, tall fescue, lucerne, subterranean clover, chicory, coxfoot, and then you can utilise that information to make very effective decisions on your farm. So that's comprising the last 40 years worth of data that has been collated from seed industry projects, from um, industry and government funded projects, which doesn't really have a home. So how can we ensure that the legacy of this data actually finds a place in our system so that we can make future decisions? because a lot of that data is actually really useful and we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. So our four sponsors of the Hill Country Futures Project, very kindly, are Beef and Land New Zealand, PGG Rights and Seeds, Seed Force, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, and this facet of the Hill Country Futures Project is delivered through the Dryland Pastures Research Team at Lincoln University, which I'm very lucky to be a part of. And as a part of this, uh, presentation which I'm going to deliver to you guys today, I'm going to ask five questions. The first one is understanding how our sector has changed over time. The second one, understanding yeah, what we can learn from the Lucerne data. There is over 354 published papers on the physiology of Lucerne. Surely we can take some of that and we can relate it back to a crop like red clover, something with a root system, even though it might be more fibrous, like plantain, a chicory crop. How can we reiterate the crop physiology practices and potential that we've gained from Lucerne and actually cross-correlate it into some different environments? The third, what are those forage options? What is the fit and how effective is that fit going to be for our different regions? What is satellite farming? And of course, we need to monetize everything we do at Lincoln, much to um, my <laughs> research colleagues' disgust, but we have to identify the size of the prize. Coming with a commercial background for over 10 years before heading back to Lincoln, um, the commercial element we need to drum into every research outcome that we're providing uh, today and tomorrow. Mm. As an agronomist, when I think about uh, the potential for a crop or a pastoral-based system, to have a high level of success in a farming system, there's three things that I look at, which is the genotype, the environment, and of course, management. When you're thinking about the genotype, that is specific to the breeding of that specific plant. It's not animal related in this instance, it's all around that plant. The physical characteristics that plant breeders are breeding for 10 years before a commercial product hits your seed brochure or your retail rep brochure where you can purchase it. So that is the breeding. When we're looking at the environment, that's your farm location, weather, soil type. The specifics to you, and as we know, they change when you hop over the fence. And management, what you can control, timing, grazing management, and agronomy programs. Collectively, New Zealand seed companies spend over $20 million in this space. 
And the irony is, if 80% of the outcome is driven by your management. Every single circumstance. So I want to introduce you to a farmer where a large proportion of the work has been completed in this phase of the Hill Country Futures Project, and it's John Chapman at Inverurie Station. So this is a traditional summer safe environment, and they receive around 850 millimetre <coughs> rainfall annually, but they get to quite a few obviously snow dumps, frosts, it's a pretty, pretty tricky environment to, to farm. But uh, the next slide might surprise you around what the potential is for pasture and crop yields from this specific environment. The first four bars of this graph I want to draw your attention to are the component of legume in that sward was 100 or very, very high from a pastoral based system. In point four, the clover dominant pasture sward was over 50% legume. And what you can produce in this pretty gnarly environment from a pasture system and a crop physiology point of view. Mm. Uh, the superbin base uh, is a bit of an outlier. This obviously received a huge amount of superphosphate, uh, the equivalent of about two and a half tonnes of super to the hectare per year. And so you can see what has happened there. We obviously we make pea available. We definitely do get a lift in pasture production with more P and more S, uh, but still cannot outdo the legumes. Uh, and as an agronomist, uh, we like to complicate things. And this is a very good example of how agronomists and soil scientists like to complicate things. Photosynthetically active radiation. That is the scientific name for light. We are all, as farmers, in the business of capturing light. The more light we can capture and the better we can utilise, the higher efficiency we can drive of that light system the higher yields we're going to achieve from our cropping situation. There are obviously three other drivers, uh, water, nitrogen and temperature. But when we start to eliminate those three drivers, water, nitrogen and temperature, as a PhD student I can start to understand what's actually yeah, working well in a set environment when it comes to lucerne, subclover, red clover, chicory, coxfoot, plantain and tall fescue. That's the only way that we can start to understand the real impact of these pasture systems uh, is how efficient they are at capturing light. Uh, this is a plantain, red and white clover sward. And as you can see, when we've got bare ground, uh, we're not very efficient at capturing light. Uh, that comes back to the management component of our three uh, phases of uh, agronomy. Uh, genotype, uh, environment uh, and management. Uh, incredibly important in terms of the photosynthetic capacity of this system is limited because we've got bare ground and we've got light which is not being captured and it's being lost to the atmosphere. When we're thinking about understanding how plants grow, we need to think about growth and development because that provides us an option to design a package of management around a specific crop option. So growth is kgs of dry matter per hectare per day. Not a lot of growth out there at the moment in the Manawatu, but that's not because there's not enough photosynthesis occurring. That is because temperature is limiting the growth of these plants. When we're thinking about development, that is the different phases which we go through in a season. For example, seed head initiation and development of a perennial ryegrass based pasture. And we need to think about the development component of these plant species because you take a crop like lucerne, and what happens when we produce stem? It completely changes the viability of that crop when we're trying to feed high growing animals a proportion of high quality feed. We can't do that when we're feeding stem. So how has our sector changed? Sheep and beef farming in New Zealand still has 92% of its farms as owner operated. The cost of capital, I'm sure you've discussed many of times today, is becoming more and more challenging as our businesses go through this, these interest rate lifts uh, which we're all experiencing at the moment. Monitoring and measuring on farm and then building a capability to actually effectively manage and have success with alternative forages on a farm system all comes at a cost uh, and that cost is your time. As farmers, not many of them have spare time. 
and when they've got a put environmental legislation about any changes that they might be making in a farm system from a crop physiology and an agronomy point of view, it's very, very tricky for those farmers to start integrating new crop choices when their time is already maxed out. Scale and access to hill country farms. Today I'm going to take you to the Mackenzie country, to Bob Roy, to Matt and Luke Topman's at Tyvee, down to Stock Grove in Amberley, and also to John Chapman's at Inverary, which is in the Ashburton Gorge. It is very tricky to get to trial sites which are not on number four dairy at, Lincoln Uni at Massey University and at uh, the Lincoln University Ashley Dean Research Farm. Mm. We need to start stretching out where actually these uh, trial sites and these data collection points are so that we can fill in the blanks uh, in terms of providing information to New Zealand farmers uh, that has value because it's close to the site and we can easily replicate it in other regions. Uh, The reduction in pastoral land use uh, and the associated uh, reduction uh, in uh, the sheep, beef, uh, deer and goat flock uh, has uh, resulted, as you guys know, in only a 5 to 10% reduction from a sheep point of view uh, in regards to the product which is produced uh, throughout this country. Uh, we are getting compressed in terms of uh, our area and the potential available for that land use. So every hectare that we have, we need to be making the most from it. 55% reduction in sheep numbers and only dropping 5-10% to depending on the year for sheep meat production is still a pretty savvy result from my point of view. And then obviously thinking about the greenhouse gas emissions which have come from our sector to provide a story for improved forages moving forward. And I'm sure Sinead will touch on this later, but the national lambing percentage lifting to 127% for the year ending 2019. That's 27% greater than what it was in 1990. All of these efficiencies driving our system. But we're obviously producing more lambs. Those lambs, we need to grow them quickly. Can we do that uh, on unapproved pasture or unapproved forages uh, in New Zealand Hill and High Country? It's a real challenge. So what we've learned from Lucerne. Mm. Lucerne's um, a pretty incredible plant in regards to its ability to store up a whole lot of uh, sugar, carbohydrate uh, in its root system and then utilise that during the spring months. So, it is uh, incredible that we can get a plant to consistently grow at 100 kgs of dry matter per hectare per day. To do that consistently for over 30 days is an incredible feat for an agronomist of any shape or form. What this plant does though is it obviously remobilizes uh, and drops uh, its uh, growth rate in the autumn months uh, to provide for those massive build up uh, of uh, dry matter growing uh, in that spring period. And so uh, it's really interesting when you've got a root system species which does this, uh, but what do other species do? Uh, what does sugar do? What does red clover do? We actually have no idea because the work hasn't been done. Uh, the work's all sitting there in terms of uh, within our research institutions and uh, also within our commercial companies, uh, but we actually haven't done this on other species, uh, and so this is gonna be a huge part of my PhD. And then what is the impact uh, of this uh, partitioning effect to the roots uh, during the autumn months, uh, how do we uh, deal with our grazing management? We all know that we spell lucerne in the autumn. Do we need to be doing this with our plantains? Uh, do we need to be doing it with chicory? These are all questions which we will uh, answer. So I want to introduce you to Bob Roy in the Mackenzie, 400 millimetres of rainfall, and it's uh, increased its uh, lucerne area from 20 hectares to 220 hectares. Uh, working through this project and just to give you an example of uh, what the numbers are. So we've obviously seen um, a big lift in commodity prices during this uh, time period. So 2012 to 2018, large lift in commodity prices, but I just want to draw you to the average sale weight. Uh, this is a 400 millimetre rainfall environment which grows uh, for six months of the year if they're very lucky. 
to be producing their land, sir, and to see that massive increase uh, in a farm like this, uh, utilising a uh, legume product, which is obviously high, pro high quality, is pretty amazing, yeah, and a start. And so which legume drives your system? Mm. All plants are nitrogen deficient except legumes. Don't get me wrong, legumes are scavengers. They will produce and fix nitrogen in the soil, but then they will use it to themselves, not to give it to the perennial ryegrass. However, it's the cycling that we get through ingestion and the repositories of urine and dung, which creates this very large advantage for farm systems. Animals need quality and quantity to grow. Legume growth is very seasonal, so when we're thinking about which legume we're going to incorporate into our system, we need to understand the seasonality requirements from it. And as a farmer, you'll be able to pop into the egg yield storage database. You'll be able to, excuse me, you'll be able to overlay your climate data and your soil data over a crop like plantain and understand exactly what the potential growth rate could be for your, for your specific farm. Not only that, you'll be able to go back, oh, it's La Nina this year. So it was La Nina in 2015, so actually let's overlay that growth rate onto our plantain so that we can pick our buy and sell, so we can understand actually when we might have a pinch depending on what our animal demand is. So management of legumes definitely trumps genetics. So and thinking about the four S's uh, with legumes, so this becomes more important when we move from grasses to legumes. So it's subdivision, it's super, it's seed, and it's stock. Uh, and then how are we, we going to establish and manage it? So Derek's done a fantastic job in all of this uh, orange uh, and yellow zone and uh, getting lucerne systems set up. Uh, um, Pokawa in the Hawke's Bay, Doug Avery's in um, Marlborough, you know, the, the Wilson Farm on the Banks Peninsula. However, all of those environments are under 900 mil rainfall. And what he hasn't done is he hasn't ventured out of the yellow and the orange. And so we bring lucerne to any clay-based soil in the Manawatu, and it gets disease and it lasts about two and a half years, and it's a significant investment. And so, how do we build a resilient rotation for summer safe environments? And when we're talking summer safe, we are talking traditional dry land environments, and this is what they produce. This is the traditional growth curve, unlimiting moisture, temperature and light during this period. The temperature becomes constrained during this period, and we produce around 6.3 tonne of dry matter to peak year. We add water, we jump on a plane from Christchurch, and we come to the good old Manawatu, and this is what happens. So we're summer safe, we're 1,000 mil of rainfall, in some instances up to 1,100, 1,200. So we can produce, on average, around 10 tonne of dry matter to the hectare. But what's the option? Eh? Well, what's the opportunity when we add nitrogen? Double what we currently grow. And I'm not saying that we should go out and chuck a whole bucket load of nitrogen on because it's far too expensive to start with at the moment but uh, legumes could be the tool to start trying to gain some of this advantage. Uh, and the advantage could be vast. Uh, so what are the forage options? Uh, as you've seen from a previous slide, uh, lucerne, red clover, plantain, all seem like really good options. Increasing the quality and quantity of the legumes in your perennial ryegrass based swarts. So trying to actually lift uh, the protein content of what's going into these animals which need to grow very, very quickly here. Yeah. And the associated uh, growth rates uh, of lucerne, red clover, and uh, some legume rich uh, and grass only here, yeah, forage options. Uh, and uh, this data is from John Chapman's uh, in the Ashburton Gorge. So what is satellite farming? <laughs> satellite farming is the concept of adopting a legume as, or a herb, a high quality forage as a part of a grazing management technique to increase the quality of the protein, megajoules of ME, and carbohydrates that you supply to your animals. So this example at John Chapman's is where he has a 20 hectare block of plantain and red clover and white clover situated to support 
the surrounding area of the resident grass species. So this area could obviously be drilled with a tractor. It's very easy to get its establishment tactics right because it is relatively flat. The contour provides him to be able to spray here. He can get fertilizer um, onto that to new crop to ensure that it actually establishes well and it'll last three to four years. So, but what satellite farming is, is taking a portion of the landscape, allowing a high, higher quality feed source, uh, supporting uh, the remaining pastoral base in that block, uh, and also trying to reduce our greenhouse gases by getting animals to grow faster. So John's face, uh, um, he very quickly identified when he broke up his farm system that these 600 hectares, which is actually 15% of the total, which he could get a tractor over and he could get some really high quality crops set up. And the remainder, um, we could incorporate uh, some, some spring helicropping in this environment, um, you know, spraying with uh, a couple of rates of uh, glyphosate and then uh, aerial establishing some legumes and herbs with a fertiliser attached to it as well through a pearl coat technology which, which the seed companies provide. But he very quickly identified 15% of the landscape which he could utilise satellite farming. <coughs> But his problem was that he had very early experience with legumes, but he sort of dropped off the radar a little bit in regards to his uh, um, knowledge which was coming into the farm system. He's quite a long way away from Lincoln University, for him to travel to seminars or ag innovation conferences, it's actually quite a barrier to entry, so to speak, because he's so far away. But he had outstanding stock information. Numbers, weights, ins, outs, it was absolutely perfect. To but the pasture information was light, to say the least, in terms of we had none. Yeah. And what we wanted to do was obviously we separated the property out into the categories, which you saw before, and the team at Lincoln put up pasture cages. So, so we had 35 sites which were replicated, and then we wanted to build a picture of what the pasture was telling us. And then John obviously made some decisions and started to convert <coughs> the landscape. Tractor, sprayer, red clover, plantain, white clover. He took uh, the most productive area off his hill and high country property, got it cranking, yeah, producing very high yields uh, to support uh, the remaining system. The result was uh, this uh, tufty area of the Anthonia around here, grew an extra 400 kgs of dry matter per hectare per year. Not a lot, but still uh, worth mentioning, yeah, just because uh, we could pull animals off at key times uh, and put them onto the high quality forage, keep them growing faster, killable weights, way they go. Another thing that he realised was when he um, put a blanket application of superphosphate on, he just exacerbated his problem. <laughs> So he produces a lot of feed in the spring because he's got 4,250 hectares. So, but then when he chucked super on, it was just like, oh God, I've produced more tucker in the time when I've already got plenty of tucker. And so what he was really trying to challenge us with uh, was uh, that his livestock are telling him that in the spring, uh, his pasture, his resident pasture, his Danthonia, grows too little. Uh, in the summer, it grows too much when he doesn't really need it. And in the autumn and winter, it becomes so unpalatable and indigestible that he can't really use it. Good idea to ask twin bearing ewes to pop onto that, have a little nibble, and spit out two lambs and get them to grow up 200 grams a day because we want to make them as hobbits. And the interesting thing was that John said to us, oh, we're just actually doing deferred grazing. And deferred grazing doesn't actually work in that environment because it's summer safe and we've got moisture. So what happens is we've got this standing hay which is still respiring. So we've got moisture in the system and it just starts to rot. Asking young lambs to consume that is very, very tricky. It's got a negative ME of 8. They're growing at negative 100 grams of larvae per hectare per day. When we have a high quality sword, which you saw in the satellite picture, we're supplying 11 megadols of ME, and we can ask them to grow up 200 grams of 
larva per hectare per day quite comfortably. This is illustrated in a massive body of work that was completed by Lydia Cranston at Massey University, which showed the legume and herb advantage. This is a, a yeah, summer, the summer situation. You can see two very different um, scenarios in 2012 and 2013. 2012, we had a relatively uh, wet summer, so the advantage wasn't as great from those legumes with a yeah, big root system, still provided a 27% advantage. But when we get to start to get the stress come on, from a summer point of view, that's when it starts to uh, increase the gain from a yeah, legume and herb advantage. Similarly, in the autumn, when we still have reproductive seed head floating around, that's when we start to see some gains and also recovery out of the drought. Uh, these root system species, um, you know, they're doing a lot of work underground. They're storing a lot of nitrogen, sugar, and carbohydrates so that when the temperature and the moisture does come right, they can just go for it. Some examples of uh, the Topman family here in Tyabe on the 25th of January here. Uh, red clover, that red clover saw there growing at 69 kgs of dry matter per hectare per day. The plantain was growing at 85. Uh, grass, uh, growing at 56. Uh, still quite a bit of seed head there. And bear in mind, this is a five star Dairy NZ FBI perennial ryegrass. Uh, grass still produces a seed head. You can see the plantain, which was growing at 142 kgs of dry matter per hectare per day here in this experiment, to just to, as the onset of the summer dry, you can see in the hills there. The red clover was growing at 106. The grass, growing at 30. The autumn recovery, yeah, 48 for a paddock of red clover, 125 for plantain, and 72 for perennial ryegrass. So what's the size of the prize? There's many hill country opportunities, but the real learnings which all of these farmers have gained is from measuring and monitoring. Plenty of PhD students out there all looking for a farm who's out of the way, so to speak, to put cages on or to come and do pasture cuts. So it's definitely a very valuable tool if any of you farmers are keen to get involved. We definitely need to compare resident and improve to not just the new five star FBI perennial ryegrass with a red clover sword. We need to be thinking about that brown top Danthonia standard, which is across a lot of the landscape. Hill country pastures are nitrogen deficient, and summer safe and summer examples of satellite farming do exist. You can see the size of the prize here when we've got three years of a red clover sward at John Chapman's at Inverary. And what we did as a management ex example in this farm system was that our red clover was starting to decline. We weren't actually intercepting that much light. Our canopy was becoming a little bit inefficient. We banged an Italian ryegrass straight through the bottom of that red clover. And the following year it produced 30.8 tonnes in an environment which only grows for about seven to eight months of the year. So the legacy effects of, past, of legume pastures can be absolutely massive in terms of providing you guys with an agronomic tool where you can pull some levers, you can reduce the opportunity cost of time around dragging a drill through a system, not having to rely on cultivation or spraying out and waiting for ground to actually be turned over, but then we can start mobilising some of that nitrogen which is sitting in the soil which has been cycled from animals throughout that three year process. The data at Stock Grove and Amberley yeah, showcases what happens in a very dry, typical summer dry environment. And I specifically chose this because this is the example which I'm going to use to determine the size of this price, how much money we can make from this satellite farming business. So, so Stock Grove, year one, right, was relatively summer safe. We got quite good rainfall throughout the year, which is why we obviously produced more. Year two of the chicory, ryegrass, and white clover based system compared to our brown top Danthonia was we had a drought. So that's why the um, numbers are obviously lower in the second year. So that's still 7.1 ton of dry matter per hectare per year. 7.15. So 8.75 million hectares of sheep and beef country. 
if we improve 5% of it to 5%. 440,000 hectares. If we grow an extra 7.15 tonne of dry matter, that's 3.1 million tonnes of dry matter, 3.1 billion kgs of dry matter per hectare per year. At 10 cents, which is probably pretty cheap, inflation, things have gone up, right? Even grass. So. 312 billion. And also, hopefully we can reduce our greenhouse gases too, because animals are not going to be on farm for as long as they were under that resident pasture regime. The difference in growth rate compared to days on farm is massive, 79% reduction in methane emissions, because they're growing faster, less wastage. Hello? Uh, just a quick question, how does that compare to Great question. So in terms of these, in this trial here, we had, uh, in terms of perennial ryegrass, right, standard practice, 3% return to nitrogen back to the system, which is an industry standard, because we're a cut and carry it from the system to get the dry matter production. The legumes got DAP at starter and nothing. So they had zero nitrogen application except for starter. So some conclusions for you, genotype, types envir times environment, times management. The most important thing when you're discussing with your seed rep, what crop choices you're going to make this spring and how they're going to, and how they're going to contribute to your farming system. Feed quality drives animal performance and we have forage options to improve productivity and meet your environmental targets. And one example is obviously the AgGills Forage Database, which is online now, and it's a free repository for anyone to enter any data which they have, or also access all of the data which has been provided through PhD students like myself. And just to acknowledge, of course, our very kind sponsors and the fantastic team which we've been working alongside throughout this process. Thank you. Questions? obviously a couple of parameters around replication and stuff like that, yeah. but what we'd do if we had, for example, a cage cut data from um, Kaikaui in Northland, we still want that data because we can still form a picture from it and, and utilise it in some way, shape or form. So it's just entered into a different part of the repository right. as if, you know, an unreplicated trial, so to speak. Yeah, because oh, okay. yeah, we want it all. We've got big clubs in the Central North Island that have been keeping cut cage data. Yeah. Like that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is, uh, you know, we, we want the, a lot of my research has been uh, collecting data from the seed industries because that obviously has quite a lot of institutional um, knowledge attached to it, but finding it at home because otherwise, you know, a seed company might be sold and then that's all lost. We're trying to, uh, we're doing some herbicide work with uh, pre-emerge chemistry to see if we can even just increase the survivability of the two species under pre-emerge. But it's really tricky when, from an establishment point of view, if you have a tricky year from an establishment point of view and you miss your window by two weeks because it's been blowing a gale and it's been raining so you can't get your any herbicide on, even though it's a, a very friendly herbicide because we're trying to save the two species, which is obviously very tricky. Um, that, that drives some really big complications because it's all around time. And so from, from my, I put my commercial hat on and you know I think to myself, 
let's either just live with some weeds or well, let's separate it out and have red and white and I can chuck you know, <coughs> some flume and some pulsar over it and I have plantain and I can chuck some dicamber over it and I can nail my calyx either way. And so it's, it's very, very tricky. So if you can get that, if you can manage your risk in terms of this from an establishment point of view and nail those weeds early even with soft chemistry with the two, it can work, but you've got to obviously get it right and there's much better people um, in this room, I'm sure, that have um, herbicide knowledge greater than Michael's me. one thing, I, I think that seeding and the other issue yep. the, the two seed very differently and I think letting the plantain go to seed it and, and it's very digestible as well, yep. tend to be shortening its life. Yep, yep, overgrown, it's, it's getting often overgrazed. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? So housed at Lincoln University, and we've got three statisticians who uh, essentially convert the data. And so I produce um, a whole lot of algorithms, right? And then you think about a heat map of New Zealand. And just like that Niwa climate heat map, what our end goal is that you've got a heat map of yield overlaid with soil type, which obviously creates a change in yield, and because it's all around potential available water and what nutrients you can store, and then temperature and uh, rainfall from the NIWA data set. And so what, uh, what we're doing is trying to produce, it's already been done for um, subterranean clover and lucerne, provide a heat map of yield potential for all of New Zealand. And then, but not only that, then you can click on your point and you can be like, okay, I live at Cheltenham. I want to um, understand where the closest trial sites were to Cheltenham. And so we've got about oh, 260 trial site locations so far. And uh, so, okay, oh, actually there was, a, um, there was a trial site of plantain on a farm in Cheltenham, so I can completely understand uh, what the results were from that trial site, so that will be like a pop-up on, um, online, you'll be able to view, you know, the, the average data for plantain for that area by week, by month. And so it's quite confusing, and you can all go online at the moment, but essentially at the moment it's just in terms of a place for you to house your data, and then myself and the statisticians are heat yielding all of New Zealand to try and make it more farmer friendly. Because at the moment, what use is a whole lot of tables to farmers? Not very helpful. And then you can specify by location, by soil type, by you know what specific year we want to relate back to from a climate point of view to hopefully make it handy. Oh, cool. Well, let's, um, Laura, just on, on behalf of everyone here, just like to thank you very much. It was Cool to see what the opportunities are out there for us if we pull finger. Yeah. So um, yeah, thank you very much, and just on behalf of um, on behalf of us. Thank you so much.